Good morning. Welcome to Foothills. It's good to see everybody. It's nice to see that sunshine out there, isn't it? I want to invite you to stand and let's sing together.
Take a couple of minutes and uh, get real friendly. Say hi to somebody around you. Make a new friend. Stretch your legs. Get out of your section. And we'll pick up in a couple of minutes.
All right, good morning, guys. You can find your seats. Everybody's very chatty this morning. It's good. Well, good morning, guys. My name is Isaac. I'm the uh, high school director here at church. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome anybody that's new this morning. Uh, if you're new and you want to get more plugged in with what's happening here at church, there's a little uh, seat back pocket in front of you, and there's a blue card. And you can just take one of those and fill it out. Uh, and that'll help us to know who you are and how you can get uh, plugged in with the ministries and different things that are going on here at church. You can also talk with Rob in the back about that. He's, he's waving back there. Uh, in addition to the blue cards, we're also revamping the um, online directory. Uh, something Foothills really wants to do is reflect God's love to our, uh, the people within the church. And a part of the way we can do that is just by knowing who's at church and uh, being able to encourage people and uh, just kind of do life together with them. And you can do that when you know who's at church. And so that's what's great about the, uh, the online directory. Uh, and we'll have a quick video on that. And if you want to get signed up and you're not on that, there is a, oh, never mind, there's not a QR code. <laughs> but you can talk to Rob about that. So, yeah. Okay. At Foothills, we are a family. And families take photos and share those photos, even when they're awkward. We would love to have your photo in our directory to make it easier for people to reach out and care for one another. So we've added some tutorials to help you add or change your photo, as well as navigate and make full use of our online directory. Simply go to foothillstaten.org, then click on About Us, and then Next Steps. Once you scroll down to our directory section, Click on directory and you will see all you need. If you still have questions, please email brenda at foothillstaten.org or stop by the information center in the back of the sanctuary. We would love to help or even take your picture and get it uploaded for you. morning. I'm Judy Buss, and I'm the children's minister here at Foothills, and I'd like to invite our family with their little one to come up. We have child dedication today. And, you know, parenting is an overwhelming job, right? A marathon, not for the faint of heart. And how do we parent well? What are the most important things we need to do as parents? I think Moses gives us a, some great parenting advice in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. And I'll read that. Yes. Oh, there we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So it helps us to, as parents to understand the most important thing that we can pass on to our little ones is the knowledge of Jesus and an authentic faith. So it's easy to lose sight in that in the day-to-day, -day, right? All the diapers and the things that all happen every day. But simply put, we want kids to know that God made them, God loves them, and Jesus wants to be their friend forever. So this family right here has had an opportunity um, to watch some videos that talk about, you know, really some important truths. And she, uh, I let, I'll let her introduce herself and the words that you've chosen for Bentley. Hi, my name is Hannah, and this is Aiden, and this little guy's Bentley. And uh, we had an opportunity to watch a video and choose three character traits that we would like for Bentley to become when he's older. And there were quite a few that I had to go through. Um, but my top three were um, for him to be faithful, forgiving, and loving. Excellent. All right. You know, time goes so quickly, and we need to be really intentional with the time that we have been given. 
So um, I hope that this list, these words, these characteristics will help you think of a bigger picture. And the day-to-day -day can be overwhelming, but we hope that you just use those words, maybe, and I've got something so that you can put them up and see them, and that will help you to be intentional each and every day with Bentley. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions, and as you answer them, you can say, we will, I will with the help of God, all right? So, will you demonstrate for your child Christian integrity in your personal life? I will with the help of God. Will you show your child the meaning of fidelity and sacrifice in all aspects of life? I will with the help of God. Will you show your child the meaning of fellowship and servanthood through the church? I will with the help of God. Will you love, serve, and obey the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength, setting the example your child needs in speech and life, training your child in the way they should go so when they are old, they will not turn from it? I will with the help of God. All right. All right. Now, parenting is a big, big a big chore, a big task, right? So church family, I'm going to call on you to stand up because it takes a village to raise children, right? So church family, your response to my question will be, we will with the help of God. Will you encourage, support, and sustain this family as they raise their children to know the love of Jesus Christ? Thank you. Be seated. Now, Hannah, I have a prayer on the screen. I'd like you to uh, join with me and, and pray. God, I declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I acknowledge that my child is a gift from you and I am a caretaker of them by your grace. I accept responsibility of raising them to know and follow you. I ask for your strength as I will do my best to give them every possible benefit of home, school, church, and community. I ask your blessing upon my child to guide and guard them through all their years. Amen. Well, you know, parenting is hard and overwhelming, but I have to say it's the best job there is. And then being a grandma is the second best. It really is. So um, I have a beautifully illustrated Bible that I think not only Bentley will enjoy, but I think Aiden will enjoy it. In fact, I'm going to have you hold it, uh, Aiden, for your mom. And we have a little a framed um, name and his characteristic traits to help you remember those things. Thank you. Here at Foothills, our mission is to glorify God, make disciples, and reflect God's love. And one of those ways is through giving. So I'm going to ask our ushers to come on up. And um, your giving helps us in discipleship, specifically in children's ministry. We have some great curriculum and I know many of you have seen some of the things that we've sent home. We want to partner with you as you disciple your children and um, help lead them to authentic faith. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Um, let's turn our hearts to the word and to prayer. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 18 says this. Indeed, everything is for your benefit so that grace extended through more and more people may cause thanksgiving to increase to God's glory. Therefore, we do not give up even though our outer person is being destroyed. Our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So there's three things that really stood out to me in here. Is in that first verse, verse 15, uh, Paul points toward uh, God being glorified through increased thanksgiving. 
So I want to encourage you this morning as we take time to pray, take time to thank the Lord for what he's done. It's easy to just plow through your day and move on to the next thing. I know, I know that very well. I, I suffer from that all the time. Uh, the other part of that is he talks about renewal. And it sounds so clean and easy as I read it, but if you remodel your home, there is a lot of chaos and destruction, a lot of demolition that happens in that renewal. So take heart in that renewal. Uh, God is at work. And then third, that we uh, shift our focus from what's seen to what's unseen, from, from what we see temporal here to that eternal weight of glory. Uh, so let's take some time and pray, and then we'll come back together and we'll sing. Father, we thank you that, uh, Lord, your word tells us about the troubles of this life, Lord, and it calls them a momentary light affliction. So, Father, help us to, uh, to zoom out and get a higher view. Father, sometimes those, those things consume all we think about. And, Father, we thank you that you tell us that that it's momentary and light compared to the eternal weight of glory, Father, or, or on the flip side of that, us having to deal with and pay for our own sins on our own. Uh, Father, we, we pray that this would lead us to lift our eyes and give you the thanks that you're due. God, as we sing and we praise, uh, God, we pray that we would praise you from the depths of our hearts, from hearts of gratitude and uh, Father, that you would fix our eyes on you today. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand and let's sing together.
are it. There, there is no higher name. There is no higher authority, no greater one we can appeal to, and no greater hope that we have. We thank you that you defeated our sin on the cross. You said it's finished. It's dealt with. And we don't have to live in that condemnation and the guilt that we have rightly earned, but you uh, put to death on the cross. Father, we, we pray that as we turn to your word today that you would teach us, God, that we would be humble and eager to hear. And God, we, we just pray that, um, that you would speak to us through your spirit, that we would take those words to heart and, and apply them to our lives, Father, that we wouldn't be people that sit here and nod in agreement and then walk out and live our lives as if we weren't here. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This morning we're going to look at those two lives that were just talked about in that video, the life that's planted by water and the life that's planted in the desert. And the question you can ask yourself today is, which am I? Am I growing in my trust in the Lord and no matter what comes in my life, I'm rooted in him and his word, or am I on my own? And when the trouble comes in life, I'm left to my own devices to figure things out. So we want to look at that today. My name is Tyler. I'm the lead pastor here. Great to have you in the room, and especially welcome to those of you who are new here. Love to shake your hand and get to know your name, and welcome if you're joining us online. Love to have you with us here in person as well. Uh, let me give you a couple like little PSA announcement type things. Uh, we'll, we'll move through this really quickly. Uh, next week and then the next two weeks after that, I want to tell you where we're going. We're going to be finishing out the book of Jeremiah. Next week, we'll look at Jeremiah 44. So if you're reading on your own, following along, or kind of want to prep yourself, you can look at Jeremiah 44. May 5th, we'll look at the fall of Jerusalem. And that's all the way at the end of the book of Jeremiah in chapter 52. Chapter 39 is also a depiction of the fall of Jerusalem as well. And so if you want to read a couple chapters on that, there's that. And then we're going to jump into a new series. We're calling it Life and Godliness. And that comes from 2 Peter. It actually comes from one verse in 2 Peter in the beginning of chapter 1. And so if you want to prep yourself, get yourself uh, oriented around 2 Peter, we'll begin preaching on that, a shorter series beginning May 12th that will take us into the middle of June, just five or six weeks long, I believe. And so that's what's, what's coming up. For today, uh, again, I want to look at this, this passage that we've been sitting with for the last couple months. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. And it says this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in parched places of the wilderness and in uninhabited salt land. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It's not anxious in the year of drought. It does not cease to bear fruit. If we put these two side by side, the one on the left is the cursed man, that's the cursed life. The man who trusts in himself or in man, makes his own flesh his strength. His heart turns away from the Lord. It's like a shrub in the desert. Doesn't see good come 
dwells in parched places and uninhabited salt land. And then the one on the right is the blessed man who trusts in the Lord. His trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water. And that tree is depicted as sending its roots out deep. And when the heat comes, and we've talked about this a few times, when the heat comes, the Christian life, a life of following Jesus in this world, is not an escapism faith. And what I mean by that is, God does not just simply protect you or evacuate you or hit the eject button on your life out of circumstances. And so when the heat comes, when the relationship that you're trusting in is broken, when your finances don't work out the way you want to, when what you've trusted in outside of the Lord doesn't measure up, when the heat comes, its leaves remain green. uh, green. It's not anxious in the year of drought. It doesn't cease to bear fruit. Even though a drought may come in our lives, God actually can produce fruit in the life of a believer in those seasons. What a great promise for us to trust in. So I want to look at a story of a couple people in Jeremiah that depict these things. And I'm going to be picking and choosing some verses to put up on the screen, but over these three chapters, chapters 36 through 38. So if you have a Bible, you're going to want to open that up and kind of follow along, and you can see where I'm filling in the blanks, and I'll just tell some stories of the, t- of the text. But otherwise, um, chapter 36 is where you want to go. If you need a Bible, we've got a couple ushers uh, here. They've got uh, Bibles out of the version I'm reading out of, which is the ESV. We'd love to get one to you. Just raise your hand, and uh, they'll bring one right to you. Chapter 36, we'll begin right in the first um, verse and kind of pick up a a portion of the story of the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, if you're new here or if you're not familiar with Jeremiah, again, welcome to Foothills. Glad to have you here. You don't have to be a Bible expert or know know really much of anything about Jeremiah to come and, and be part of this. But Jeremiah is a prophet. He is being used by God to speak messages to God's people. And this is an Old Testament book. So this happened um, about 2,500 years ago, the events of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is speaking a message to God's people that is not an easy message to receive. God is bringing judgment on his people because of their lack of obedience, their, the evil, the, the worship that they had of false gods, and, and even... Um, the way that they just generally lived their lives, disobedient to the Lord and unaware of what he was doing or trying to communicate to them. And so this is Jeremiah's life, a very hard life. God picks him as a young man, sets him apart, and his life is one that's just consistently proclaiming whatever God tells him to tell the people. Doesn't have friends, doesn't have a family, doesn't have an offspring, kind of left by himself for the most part in his relationship with the Lord and has kind of one friend, and we'll see him again in this passage, a guy named Baruch. And so let's look at this this passage here in in chapter 36. So this is the context here in chapter 36. In the first verse, it says, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. And this is what happens in his life. He gets a word from the Lord. God speaks to him. He's to declare it. And this is what God says, take a scroll and write on it all the words I've spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. Okay, this was the common, um, this is the common utensil, or not even utensil, but this is a common thing that people wrote down laws and decrees and agreements was a scroll. So think of like a roll of uh, paper towels you know, except for parchment, right? And it's one long sheet of paper. And God is saying, go grab one of those and everything I've said to you up to this point, write it down. Big assignment. And so he says, I want you to do this because it may be that the house of Judah, well, well, they're going to hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. This is what, this, in the midst of the impending doom that God has been declaring over and over again through the life of Jeremiah, God's ultimate goal is this. It's not like God is taking tons of pleasure in bringing uh, the, the, Chaldean, the Babylonians in and destroying Jerusalem and taking them off into exile, because that's what God's been saying. And so uh, we pick it up in verse 4. He says, Then Jeremiah calls Baruch, this is his one friend, 
son of Neriah, and Baruch is the scribe. And so he writes down on the scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words that the Lord had spoken to him. So Jeremiah is recounting all this, and Baruch sitting, you know, probably right next to him at a table. He's rolling out the scroll and he's he's writing it down. He's getting that hand cramp all day long, right? Painless or pain, painful work over the course of probably a long time. And Jeremiah ordered Baruch and he says, I'm banned from going to the house of the Lord. Now, we don't know why, but Jeremiah has been kicked out of the house of the Lord. The, the lone true prophet from the people of Israel has gotten kicked out of where he would typically declare the words of the Lord. So he says to Baruch, so you're going to go. And on a day of fasting and the hearing of all the people in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. And you shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. So here's what's happening, just in case anyone's lost. God says to Jeremiah, write down everything I've said to you on a scroll. Jeremiah gets his, his um, scribe, Baruch, and says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write this down. And on top of that, Jeremiah says, I can't get to the house of the Lord. I'm banned from it. So what I want you to do in my place, Baruch, is take that scroll you're writing and stand in front of the people on a day of fasting when everyone's going to come together and read the words of my words that I've received from the Lord. All these word, these harsh words of God's judgment, impending doom of the, Bab- of the Babylonian exile. And so he tells them this, and he says, it may be, he almost, re- he almost um, recites what God has told him, it may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord as they hear the words of Jeremiah, and that everyone will turn from their evil way for great is the anger and the wrath of the Lord that he has pronounced against his people. And so Baruch, son of Neriah, did all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. That, that's what took place. I want to pause right here and just note this. In the book of Jeremiah, if you've been reading along, you've been following along in the series, it's, oftentimes it's hard to see God's compassion and love working itself out because it's a... It's a story of harsh conditions and people who have been bent against the ways of God for generations. And God has seemingly lost all patience with them. And some of you know exactly what that's like. You've probably experienced that this week. Maybe you've got a kid in your house and you either thought or said, I can take all I can take, or I've had it up to here. Or maybe you have a sibling, if you're younger in the room, and you thought, I don't, I don't have any more patience. I don't have any more kind words. I better remove myself from the situation, or I'm going to say or do something I'm going to regret later. later. We've, we've all been there, and that's where God's at, except for he's a perfect God who has perfect, just ways of, of punishment and wrath and anger, and that's what we've been hearing about, chapter after chapter after chapter, and yet God is still saying, I'm going to declare these words again, like I'm going to have you write them down, they're going to be read in front of the people, and I'm hoping that when the people hear this, their hearts will turn to me. Jeremiah is saying, maybe, when, maybe Baruch, when you read this, everybody's going to turn from their evil way. And God's anger and wrath that he's pronounced against them, maybe, maybe, that'll, maybe that'll change as God sees their hearts turn. So I want to I just recognize that in the midst of uh, what well, we're going to look at these two lives, the king and his response to God's word, and then Jeremiah and his response to God's word. I want to put in front of you a discipleship cue. These are just statements and then maybe some questions or some practices that we can engage in this week as we look at God's word and then respond to it. The first one is this. God is patiently, lovingly, and graciously wanting his people to turn to him. I mean, that's a great truth in the book of Jeremiah. It's not like God is just bent against his people and wanting to punish them relentlessly, regardless of what their mind or what their wills or what their hearts are doing. He wants their devotion. And even seemingly at the last moments, of their last chance to turn to him, he's still waiting and holding out hope for them. So a couple questions for us is, how has God demonstrated this with me? 
That's a great question for me to ask myself and to reflect on. It's a great question for you to ask yourself, is how has God demonstrated this with me? How has God patiently, lovingly, and graciously wanted me to turn to him? Maybe you can think back on your life, and you have some perspective, and you go, you know, I was quite a knucklehead at some point, or I was really caught up in an addiction or a sin or just bad patterns and bad relationships. Maybe I just didn't know my general need for the Lord. And wasn't it good that God patiently, lovingly, and graciously waited for me to turn to him? Even as a follower of Jesus, you can still answer that question in your, in your life. I can answer that question in my life. How is God waiting patiently, lovingly, graciously waiting for me to turn to him. And then maybe a great follow-up question for us as well is, what's holding me back from turning to God right now? I think God is consistently pursuing us and asking us to consider following him in deeper and new ways. So that might beg another question is, what is God asking you to follow him in? And as you discover that, you're going to find that you might have to give something up. You might have to get yourself uncomfortable in a new way and that holding yourself back from turning from the Lord is just a small picture of what the, the people of Israel had done for generations. And it grew from smaller choices into big, grandiose choices. What we see in the book of Jeremiah doesn't just spring up out of nowhere. It was born out of people consistently making smaller choices and medium-sized choices and bigger choices and then choices that you look at the text and you're going like, how in the world are they doing these things? And so what is God, um, what is holding me back right now from turning to God? Let's go back into the text. In verse 7, we see this. It, it, may, be, it may be their plea, right? Back into the text. That, that maybe they're going to turn. Right? Maybe they're going to turn. So Jeremiah's had Baruch write down the scroll. He's going to read it in front of the people. And then uh, the text. Let me just summarize a couple things and we'll jump back into the text. A fast does get proclaimed. The people gather together. Um, Baruch does what Jeremiah wants. He has the scroll. He reads the scroll. And then someone in the crowd is listening and goes like, I noticed, I noticed like the king and his officials aren't out here. This seems like the... The king should know this. At least his officials should know this. Like this this proclamation that Jeremiah has is, once again, Jerusalem's going down. The people are going to get taken into captivity. The king himself will not be able to defend himself. All these kinds of things is what Jeremiah is, is, um, is having read out by Baruch. And so they go get these officials, and they go, hey, Baruch, would you come, and would you tell this again to the people of the king's court? And so uh, verse 15, we'll pick up that story. They say to him, would you sit down and read it? And so Baruch reads the scroll again to these people, this new crowd that wasn't part of the general mass of people. And when they heard all the words, they turned to one another in fear. And they're like, oh, my word. (laughs) If this is true, we're in a heap of trouble. And so they also turn to Baruch and go, we've got to report this to the king now. Like, it's our obligation, right? So think in, in our setting in America. If someone made a threat against a political figure, the president, a governor, a senator, or anything like that, and there was someone who worked in law enforcement, or even just you as a general citizen, you might go like, okay, I can't, I can't just let that <laughs> go unheard from the king or from the president or whoever. Like, this has to be reported. And so that's what they do. They say, um, tell us, right? We must report this to the king. Tell us, how did you write all these words? Like, where did you get this from? Was it at his dictation? They're talking about Jeremiah. And and Baruch says, yeah, he dictated all these words to me. Well, I wrote them um, with ink on the scroll. And the officials say to Baruch, okay, you and your buddy, Jeremiah, uh, this isn't good. Like, you're They're not necessarily calling for the king's head. They're just predicting it. So they say, go and hide. You and Jeremiah, go into hiding and let no one know where you are. So these people, they take the scroll. They they confiscate it, most likely. It doesn't really say in the text, but somehow they end up with the scroll, and they go to the king. Jeremiah and Baruch are in hiding somewhere. The text doesn't really say where. They go to the king. And this is where we pick up the scene with the king. And It was the ninth month. The king's sitting in his winter house. Doesn't that sound lovely? (laughs) 
He's off in his winter house. There's a fire burning. There's a pot before him. And Jehudai reads three or four columns out of this scroll. This is Jeremiah's word. This is the word of the Lord. And the king, as he's listening to him, gets a knife out. And he cuts those columns out as this guy's reading it to him. And he starts to throw them into the pot, this fire pot. And they read through the whole scroll of Jeremiah. And section by section, piece by piece, he cuts it out and throws it in the fire. Cuts it out, throws it in the fire. This, this is like maybe the apex in the book of Jeremiah about the king and the people disregarding the word of the Lord. It says um, in verse 24, neither the king nor his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. No, like no one, doesn't say how many people were there, but no one went like, oh my word, what is happening? This is the word of the Lord from the prophet of the Lord. And he's not just disregarding it, he's destroying it. So these people that were there, even when El Nathan and Deliah and Jeremiah urged the king not to burn the scroll. Like, king, stop burning the scroll because this might not go how we want it. He wouldn't listen to them. This, this is a picture of that shrub in the desert. This is a picture of what happens when humans disregard the word of the Lord. This is like the end of that process. Because not only was the king like, eh, that's, that works for you, you know, you do that and I'll do me. Or, okay, I hear the word of the Lord and, you know, but I'm going to take the word of the Lord and I'm just going to put it up on the shelf. I mean, this is way far down the line of the king saying like, not only do I not believe in the word of the Lord, I don't think anyone else needs to hear this. Like, this needs to be destroyed. I want to ask some questions in regard to this, because this, this is a great opportunity for us to go like, okay, that's, again, that's the extreme, but let's backtrack several steps from you and I being like that king and say like, what am I doing currently with the word of the Lord so that I don't look anything like that and I'm not on a path that looks like that, okay? So this, this king, Jehoiakim is his name. He fully rejects God's word. When he burns the pages, it's a picture of what we do when we reject God's word. It can be a picture of that, okay? So a couple questions for us, just two. How have I rejected God's word? How have I rejected God's word? Have you ever been like me and you just don't read God's word? You don't open yourself up to God's word? You ever been in a season like that? Where you just, you're out of practice? That's one form of rejecting God's word is just like, I'm, if I don't have to hear it, then I don't have to, I don't have to obey it. I don't even have to meditate on it. I don't have to do anything with it. I just, I won't put it in front of me and I don't even have to take the next step. Sometimes uh, we reject God's word when we read it, but we don't really listen or intend to obey it. That can be a form of rejecting God's word. Sometimes um, rejecting God's word simply looks like um, we give God the leftovers of our life. And it's like, instead of treating God's word as prominent in our life, it's like, I will get to it after I get to this, that, and the other thing, right? I'll get to it after I read the, the news of the morning. I'll get to it after I check my stocks. I'll get to it after my homework. I'll get to it after I practice this thing I'm trying to become good in, this whatever skill I'm trying to acquire. I'll get to it after that. And then oftentimes we find ourselves giving God the leftovers. You know, our attention isn't quite as sharp. Our heart maybe isn't quite as open because we're tired, depending on when we choose to read God's word or how we choose to. And then another thing is sometimes I reject God's word because I just simply have too many other voices and commentaries and things in my life. Have you ever been there? Where you're just like, I just, not that I'm an expert in anything, I'm just, I know a lot about a lot of things that don't really matter. I just 
read and listen and hear a lot of things throughout the day and throughout the week. And God's word, I'm trying to figure out how to work it into my life and weave it into my life, but it's just one of like 10 things that has my attention. And then another question that might just change the way you process this idea is how have I neglected God's word? I'm not going to say any more on that because I think I've covered some of that in what I just said. And then the last question is, what can I do to change this? Just a simple question. What can I do to change this? And I would guess most of us in the room don't need to read a lot of Bible or to make any grandiose um, plans. I think most often God works in really small ways when we're reading our Bibles. Just like, just reading it slowly just a couple verses even a day. So one thing you might be able to do, maybe you go like, Jeremiah, you know, it's not doing it for me. Or you go like, okay, I, I need, to, um, need to figure out something to read. Maybe you just open up Second Peter and you just read it. I mean, Second Peter, you can read, um, you could read like one chapter a day. It would take you three, four minutes. You could, you could get yourself on a Second Peter rhythm as you prepare for us teaching and preaching. You could read the whole thing in 15, 20 minutes a day. You could just read. You could, you could sort it out and just go, I'm going to read like three verses a day for the next couple months and just read, you know, pick it up. And s- set it before me a couple times a day and just read these two, three verses and just kind of meditate on it. What can you do to change that? Um, back into the text, okay? Now we're in, ver- in chapter 37. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reign instead of Coniah, son of Jehoiakim. There's probably a lot I could say about that, but basically one of the things that, that Jeremiah said was, like, the king, you're going down. And no one, like none, of your, none of your descendants are going to reign. This is actually a fulfillment of God's word. So the king never turns. The, the previous king never turns. This next king set up as kind of a puppet king by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and he, he establishes a different king, not from the line of um, Jehoiakim. So he sets this king up, and it says, But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord that, that he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. So this king, this new king, Zedekiah, you see his name right up there, he sends some officials to Jeremiah, and there's actually some promise. He's like, Hey, Jeremiah, can you pray for us? Can you pray for the people? And so he doesn't seemingly do the same sins as the previous king. And what I want to focus on is not so much the king, but Jeremiah. So Jeremiah and Baruch were sent off into hiding. And then we see in verse 6 here in this next chapter, uh, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah again, and thus is the Lord, the Lord, God of Israel, thus you're going to say to this new king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of me. God knows, like, this king, right? And um, he says, Behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt to its own land. So here's what's happened. The, the kings and the political officials of Israel, they see Babylonia is coming to attack. And rather than going like, Ah, Jeremiah's been talking about this. They go, Let's go to Egypt and make an ally and let's see if we can ward off these Babylonians, the Chaldeans, interchangeable kind of names there, right? And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city. They're going to capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord, do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely go away from us. This is what they have been telling themselves. This is what the false prophets have been saying. This is what the people and the king of God had believed in. The Chaldeans are going to leave us alone. We've got the Egyptians on our side. He says, they're not going to go, they're not going to go away. He says, even, this is God's message to Jeremiah that he's going to say to the king, even if you should defeat the whole army of the Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men. Like you got in a battle, you took a bunch of them out, and the only ones that were left, they're all just messed up. Limbs are, you know, damaged. They're just, they're, they're hurting. They're, they look like they're about to run into the hills. He said, every man in his tent, they would rise up and still come back and burn the city with fire. Now the Chaldean when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah sent out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion. So this is the message, and then this is the lie. That was the message. This is the life of Jeremiah. They're under attack. It's wartime. 
And people are, uh, maybe it's a governmental system, we're not quite sure, but people like Jeremiah had to go to receive bread every day. You think of different, time, different war times in our country or other countries where it's like, they don't even, like, fields are getting bombed, the production lines are down, the roadways are messed up, bridges are collapsed. And so they've got to figure out a way to feed the people. And that's what Jeremiah is living in that land, in that setting. And so when he goes to Benjamin's gate, a sentry there named Erijah, the son of Shelemiah, son of Hananiah, sees Jeremiah the prophet. Okay? So Jeremiah's got this message. He's living in wartime. He's about to start declaring this message to a new king. It's the same message, basically, that he's been proclaiming for a while. And Jeremiah hears this guy capture him and says, you're deserting to the Chaldeans? And Jeremiah says, no, I'm not going away with the Chaldeans. That's a lie. I'm not deserting to the Chaldeans. Verijah would not listen to him. He seizes Jeremiah. He brings him to the officials. And the officials were enraged at Jeremiah. They beat him up. They imprisoned him. In the house of Jonathan, the secretary, because that part of the house of the secretary, or house of Jonathan, the secretary, had been made into a prison. So Jeremiah, here's the story arc in this little section of Jeremiah. He, he declares the word of the Lord, him and Baruch, it's a scroll in front of the king, and they get thrown into hiding. He's living his life because a message from the Lord, he's, he's preparing and planning and, and even beginning to proclaim it. And this, this crazy guy, um, says some things that aren't even true of him, and he gets thrown into prison. Jeremiah's life is not on an upward trajectory as far as receiving favor or um, having his circumstances be pleasurable. I mean, even in the midst of just going every day for his daily rations, it's not working out for him. He actually, his situation worsens. The city's under siege, and he's thrown into prison. I'm reminded of Jeremiah. He receives... This from the Lord. This is way back in Jeremiah 1. This is the call of his life. This is part of the text from Jeremiah 1. This is Jeremiah saying, Lord, behold, I don't know how to speak. Like, why are you choosing me? I'm just, a, I'm just a youth. And God says to him, don't say I'm only youth. For all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. I'm with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand out and he touched my mouth and the Lord said to me, he said to me, behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I've set you this day over nations, over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow and build and plant. This is what Jeremiah's life was. And check out what he says right in the midst here. I'm going back one slide, right in the midst of the section. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm going to deliver you. And God knows that Jeremiah's life is not going to be easy. God knows that Jeremiah is going to feel like a lone ranger. God knows that he's going to be squeezed by pressures all around him. And as he's declaring the word of the Lord, God knows that, and as he's living by the word of the Lord, God knows that it's, there's going to be um, times in Jeremiah's life when he is treated harshly because of his devout devotion to God. And God says, I'm going to be with you. I will deliver you. Just continue to trust in me. I've chosen you to be this man who I'm going to send, this, send out with this message. And so Jeremiah lives his life holding on to these promises of God. And so when he goes to the dungeon cells and he remains there for days, this is what happens. When his life is going down, he has choices to make, like you and I do. Do I continue to trust in God and his promises? Or do I let my situation, my feelings, my perspective dictate how I'm going to live? King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah says, There is. You're going to be delivered into the, king, the hand of the king of Babylon. He goes on from there and, and declares what the same message that he's been declaring to the previous king, to the people. It's not, he's standing in front of the king and says, yeah, actually, you're going to get taken off into exile, captivity, into Babylon. And Jeremiah, 
finds himself in chapter 38, and we'll move through this text pretty quick. He finds himself again, right, in front of these people, Shephatiah, son of Matan, and Gedaliah, Gedaliah, and the, uh, the son of Pasher, Jukol, the son of uh, Shemali- Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malachi, and they heard the words of the Lord, right? Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city city shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and those who go out to the Chaldeans shall live. Like he's saying, if you you stay here, the city's going to destruction. If you go with the Chaldeans, you're actually going to live. A few weeks ago, Kurt talked about how God's desire was for the people to actually seek the welfare of that new city, to be prosperous, to actually find life in that new city. But not if they stay, Jeremiah says. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, the, the city that we're in here, it's going to be given in the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. And the officials said to the king, let this man be put to death. He's weakening the hands of the soldiers that are left in the city. They're, they're like taking their, some of their last stands against the attacks of the Babylonians. And Jeremiah is still proclaiming his message. And they're like, tell this guy to shut up. And in fact, just kill him. Because the message that he's proclaiming is getting into the ears of the soldiers, and they're, they're having second doubts. And we don't need that from our soldiers as they defend the city. And they get into the hands of the people by speaking such words to them. This man, now catch this, this is a callback to that passage in Jeremiah 29. This man's not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. And that's actually the opposite of what Jeremiah was doing. And King Zedekiah said, behold, he's in your hands. He kind of wipes his hands of it and says, do what you want. The king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah. They cast him in the cistern of Melchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. This makes me think of Joseph. Some of you know that story as he goes down in the well. So the arc here in these three chapters of Jeremiah is goes into hiding, thrown into prison, sinks down even further, like literally sinks down in the mud of the cistern. Jeremiah uh, gets rescued out of that. An Ethiopian group of people led by an Ethiopian come and they, they tie together a bunch of rags and clothes and they tell Jeremiah, put them under your arms and they lift them out of that. Jeremiah experiences the promises of God that, that God is with him, that he will be delivered. And when he comes out of that, Jeremiah gets in front of the king and he says, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life's gonna be spared. The city shall not be burned with fire and you and your house will live. But if you do not surrender to the official of the king of Babylon, the city will be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They'll burn it with fire, and you shall not escape. This is fascinating to me. Jeremiah still is trusting in the word of God. If If you're reading this just as a story, the story arc is this. Jeremiah goes into hiding. Jeremiah goes to prison. Jeremiah gets thrown in a well. And each time he, he preaches a message and then his circumstances get worse. He preaches a message and his circumstances get worse. He's living by the word of God and his circumstance getting worse. How can he do that? How can he get taken up, saved out of the well, and still proclaim the same message face to face with the king? It's because he's a tree planted by waters. He's a tree that even in the droughts of life, in the deserts, and even in uh, a season where no rain is coming, he can trust in the word of the Lord. He can actually see fruit in his life being built and coming out of his life despite his circumstances. He can trust in this promise that God has given him, and it's actually a promise that God gives everybody in the life of Jesus and life lived by the Spirit that God will not leave you and he will not forsake you and God will deliver you in this life and in the life to come. What a great promise that Jeremiah, like a living example 
of trusting in God's word, living by it and proclaiming it. So I got these discipleship cues, uh, this last set here. And as I read these, I'm going to ask our worship team to come forward because we're going to end in singing. And there's a great, like this first song um, is a great reminder of what we looked at earlier, that God is looking and longing for people to trust in his mercy, even in the midst of our sin and, and failures, we get to trust in him. This discipleship cue is this. Jeremiah was, was able to handle the hiding, the prison, the cistern, because he had been year after year trusting in God, right? That's, that's a mark of someone who has been faithful year after year, and you have that opportunity. And maybe some of you even lived that life. You've been putting your trust in God faithfully year after year after year. And when the drought comes, when it comes, you have this steadfast faith in God and you'll recognize his steadfast faith to you and his promises. So you can ask God. You can pray to him. Even now, as we're wrapping up, pray to him that he would build this trust in your life as you build trust in his word. You say, God, would you build a Jeremiah-like trust in you, into my life, as I trust in your word. So I want you to just think on that, pray that out to God. And in just a few moments, uh, Andy and our team will lead us in in the closing with some worship here. I want to invite you to stay and let's sing together. He's
Pray. 
Father, we thank you for your great love. Father, that you would, when we head the wrong way, that you would constantly call us home, that you would send people to walk alongside of us, to call us back to the right path, to save us from our own self-destruction. And God, I pray that we would take that from today, Father, that, that maybe you want to call us alongside somebody who is who is walking uh, away from you. Father, maybe, maybe we need somebody alongside of us that's calling us back to trust in you, to follow you, not just with our words, but with our actions, with all of our life, Father. God, strengthen us through your spirit, Lord, to have your eyes. Lord, that we could get the, the plank out of our own eye before we get the speck out of our brother or sister's eye. God, we pray that we would walk in your spirit, that we would walk in the hope of Jesus Christ to our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, that you would give us boldness and that you would help us to trust in you in the midst of those situations, Lord, where we feel we're way and over our head. God, we love you. We look to you in hope. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you guys. We'll see you back here next week.